Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 26, 2010, and my guest is David Brady, the Davies Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and a professor of political science here at Stanford University. Dave, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. We're having this conversation roughly three months from a midterm election of 2010. Uh, what's the mood of the electorate? What are the issues they're worried about, excited about, and uh, what's going to happen? Well, one way to answer that question is sort of to do an average, but I think the uh, mood of the electorate varies by uh, political party. Uh, the Republicans are uh, not happy. Uh, most of the Tea Party members who are upset about government spending are Republican. Uh, Democrats are pretty, uh, still pretty uh, happy with the president, still has about an 80% approval rating among Democrats. But it's the all-important independence where uh, the mood of the country has changed. Uh, the independents, uh, who are growing in number uh, over the past uh, year and a half, uh, they, their number has increased. They're, they're now about 40% or so. Uh, they're, they're, they're very unhappy with what's going on in the economy. They're unhappy with health care, unhappy with taxes, unhappy with spending, and their mood uh, more closely approximates the Republican mood than the Democratic mood. And when you talk about their their mood on any of these issues, you're basing these observations on survey data that you've generated or looked at, correct? Right, Sur survey data, uh, both from uh, sort of an average across the 15 or 20 polls that are good and uh, surveys that uh, here at Hoover Institution we've uh, Commission from YouGov Polymetrics, which does the polling for um, The Economist. We've uh, hired several of their polls. And just for a brief digression on the Tea Party, do, is it, you, know, you hear a lot of dramatic things about them, pro and con. Do we know anything, is there anything stable about those, their preferences, or is it more fluid? Well, uh, we do know that if you think of, uh, so, so think of uh, the American electorate as divided uh, along an x-axis uh, that is a traditional liberal conservative on the economy, and then another axis that's uh, horizontal, uh, across, or vertical across the horizontal, and that axis is social uh, conservative. Uh, we know that uh, a traditional sort of uh, sur survey, so what we've been doing on YouGov Polymetrics is surveying the same uh, 1,200 people over the last, from 2004, and there's a panel out of which we're going to select these, uh, these people, so we have, we're tracing it over time. Uh, there's about 7% who are uh, tradi the traditional liberal on the left side and uh, socially liberal, about 9% that are economically and socially conservative, 24% uh, or so who are uh, economically conservative. And uh, the bottom line, though, is that the bulk of the American public is, is sort of in the middle. They're neither too liberal on economics nor conservative, and they're not too liberal or too conservative on social matters. And those are the voters that are going to decide, uh, decide the election. They are uh, somewhat sympathetic to Tea Party concerns about too much government spending, but they're not uh, to, the, to, the, to the extreme that the Tea Party is. And especially I would think, well, I, don't, I actually have no idea what someone who self-identifies as a Tea Party or what they say about social issues. What we hear about are the economic issues or the, the spending issue. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's the issue that tends to dominate it. Of uh, people who, so if we just ask the question, are you sympathetic to the Tea Party, without defining the issue, so are you sympathetic to the Tea Party movement? Uh, it turns out that that's not so high. There are more people that are actually unsympathetic to it than sympathetic. But uh, the people who are somewhat sympathetic to it, the main issue driving it is uh, taxes and spending. So what do you think is going to happen in the House in this midterm election coming up in November? Uh, traditionally, meaning based on the data, uh, the 
party in power and the White House loses seats after that first, in that first midterm election, correct? Well, while we have data that goes back on these uh, elections quite, quite a while, I prefer to sort of start the, my time series from post-World War II, where it's called out of the modern period of congressional elections. On average, uh, Democratic uh, presidents in their first term have lost about 30 seats. Democrats or Republican presidents in their first term uh, have lost about 16 seats. Uh, but one of the reasons for that uh, discrepancy is because over the time period from 1946 to 2010, the Democrats have, uh, as you know, controlled the House more. Got a bigger sample. <laughs> yeah, a bigger sample. So when you average that out, uh, say the average, is, average loss is about 20, uh, 22, 23 seats. Uh, but there's a lot of variance, sure. uh, a, a lot of variance in that. So then, of course, we put together models to try and uh, predict across these things. Why, before we get to the, this particular election, why is it that incumbent presidents lose seats from their party's uh, delegation? What do we What do we know about that? We just it takes now we take it as a fact. Well, of course he's going to lose seats. The question is how much. Why, why would yeah, that be? well, the the story was for for a long time uh, that that turned out to be a big question because they always lost. Sometimes they would lose less, and uh, well, like JFK uh, in 1962 only lost four House seats, and then uh, in 1998 uh, Clinton and the Democrats gained seats. And then in 2002, uh, Bush gained seats uh, in the House of Representatives. So we've had uh, cases uh, where that has not happened. The traditional explanation was that what happened was that in the presidential election year, uh, voters uh, who weren't strong party identifiers would come out and vote. Sort of marginal voters would be induced to vote by all the hype of the election. Then, and those, those are the voters who would be most likely to be affected by short-term factors. Uh, so if the economy's bad in 2008, Obama and the Democratic Party get a boost because he's the beneficiary of the bad economy. Um, then what happens is in the off-year election, uh, those are the very people who stay away because they're, they're, there's no hype in the midterm. And so the result was the sort of normal party affiliation came back. And that explained for quite up, up until I think about Reagan's second victory and then Bush's win. That, that explanation se seemed to be all right uh, because the, the Democrats could control the House of Representatives because uh, that was the normal party affiliation. Republicans would occasionally win presidencies because of short-term factors. <coughs> Because the short term, short term factors. factors benefiting them, but at a certain point, I think about eighty eight, as my colleague Morris Fiorina pointed out, that explanation sort of went to hell. Because why are the Republicans continuing to win the presidency in the House, and then the and then it switched to well, Democrats have a natural advantage in the House because they're willing to do the sorts of things to take care of the district that happened, and then the nineteen ninety four election came along and. Uh, and so I, I would say that I which don't was think, a, an outlier yeah, because yeah outlier election in which the Republicans won big and then they controlled the House in uh, ninety six ninety eight two thousand and two thousand and two and and two thousand and four so they didn't lose it till two thousand and six so uh, we don't have a very good so one explanation is well who votes in the uh, presidential versus the off year that that's probably a part of it. Uh, a second explanation is that the president uh, goes in with very high expectations, and then those unrealistic, yeah, unrealistic expectations. For, uh, Obama. Changing politics Ex in Washington—that's going to be exactly. breeze in two years. Yeah. Exactly. So what happens is uh, some of his core supporters fall away, and so have you looked at the press today? Obama, and the, like uh, the New York Times, Marine Dowd and Paul Krugman and others have been after Obama for not being passionate enough about. Uh, what happened in the Gulf of Mexico, the reason that the cap and trade failed was in part he wasn't enthusiastic. So what happens is the president makes, re and the war, right, the, obviously the fact that we continue to be involved in Afghanistan and increased troops. Uh, so, so a part of the reason is that the juice in the party sort of goes out because nobody could possibly live up to those expectations. The combination of all those things uh, uh, and uh, so on. But I don't, I don't think actually there is a very good 
explanation that, that accounts for it. And what do you think uh, is going to happen this time? Well, uh, I think that the Democrats were, are going to lose quite a few seats. Um, uh, just to, so, so the way so the way people normally think of it, they they want to predict the loss to the president's party in the House midterm elections, and and therefore they run uh, pretty straightforward regressions where you put in how many seats how many seats do you have versus because if you got more you could you're going to you could have a chance yeah. to lose more. You put in uh, some people put in the state of the economy, some people put in the president's popularity. Some people put in, are you at war? So there's a whole series of right-hand side variables, and, uh, and then you just run the regression over time. Some people run back to 1900. Some people start in 46. I think probably the better one, the, the best ones, if you're using survey data about how far is the pre what's the president's job approval rating, uh, and then the generic ballot, of course, which is the question, the election were held tomorrow. Uh, who would you vote for? And and so Republican or Democrat? Yeah, not right, right. A particular sorry. candidate. Yeah, who would you vote for exactly? Uh, uh, Democrat or Republican? When when you look at those for this particular election, uh, the people are predicting anywhere from thirty to fifty five seat loss for the Democrats. Um, our own data on that shows it to be, I know, and it's, I know it seems like, well, this can't be much of a prediction because the it's numbers you're about to give. Yeah, it's a big range. So our, our numbers are uh, not just based on the national average. Our numbers are looking at, uh, key, went back and oversampled in key districts. And we're 28 minimum uh, to as many as 50. So the Democrats could lose control of the House of Representatives. Uh, Depends how things are happen. Uh, depends on what happens in the next uh, uh, over uh, next time period before the election. Sure. Uh, there one other comment I want to make on that is, I prefer variables. I I don't actually. I don't. I think that president models of presidential election years are much better, because in those you got like the economist Ray Fair who sort of started that with the. It's a really good model where he looks at growth and real income. And uh, he's got that back to the 1880s, uh, thanks to data that Christina Romer uh, created that make the data set valid back. And, and you know, you can do pretty well predicting, predicting presidential. just based on presidential. And the reason for it, I think, is, so the prediction is the, pre the incumbent president or the incumbent president's party, if he's not running, will we'll, uh, win or lose the presidency uh, depending upon how the economy is doing. Period. Period. Yeah. Now, over time, they've added, uh, uh, so that's kind of the butter model. Yeah. Over time, they've added guns to it, where you look at the Korean and Vietnam War, the two, the two years that really don't predict that very well are, are 52 and, uh, and uh, 66. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so the bottom line is, if you put the guns and butter model, which which sort of makes present, uh, sense in that the, the electorate holds the president responsible for the state of the economy, and they hold the president responsible for whatever foreign wars you're in. Um, so, I prefer those sorts in the president. But remember, in a in a congressional election, you're you're looking at 435 elections, and while on average you'd think those things would wash out. Really, the number of swing districts is about 60, 70 at max. Because? Because of uh, drawing the district, the way they yeah. draw the districts, the incumbency factor. Uh, so it turns out so that... So there, there's a lot of seats that we exactly. know nothing's going to... Exactly. They really aren't up for grabs. Exactly. They run every two years, but... Yeah, so you're... Exactly. So you're running this regression, and you've got maybe 360 seats that are fixed. Nothing's going to happen. So you're running and the regression over 435, <laughs> and it's messing up the prediction. Yeah. So, uh, so I think those models... So I'm, I'm... I mean, they're better than not having them. But uh, my view on that is on congressional elections, I always try and look more carefully and go back to some of the districts to look and see because of that, uh, that sort of problem. There's three, so you're really running it over 70 or 80 districts, mm -hmm. and you're uh, averaging over 430, and, and, uh, uh, and I don't think we have as a pro. And, and then the final thing is, what, 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 uh, so what's supposed to account for this uh, midterm loss is you got public opinion polls on the generic ballot. You, you have public opinion polls on how, what about the president's job approval or what do you think about Congress, how's it doing? Uh, 
And, and what, I, what, what I have some problem with is that, first of all, if you're doing that, you, can, you can't do predict elections much past 46 because there are no polls. There are data for the, the, yeah, the, the generic data. The generic ballot data begin in 46 with the ballot. So uh, I actually think a better measure, uh, which will give you an extended amount of time, which is not included, is uh, par party identification. And what I mean by that is the way political scientists have conceived of party identification is it's sort of fixed. One point of view was, you know, you learn from your parents. You, you knew your parents were Democrats, and therefore you were a Democrat or vice versa. And you stayed, and basically that stayed with you, and you saw the world as a Democrat or a Republican. Um, that's changed now. We know that retrospectively people do change their party affiliation based on, sort, uh, based on events. But uh, it seems to me that one thing that is uh, useful here is that when voters are moving from Republican to independent or independent to Democrat or vice versa, voters don't really switch from Democrat to Republican or Republican to Democrat. They use mm. independency as a halfway house. <laughs> and, uh, so, test the waters a yes. little bit. Yeah. So, uh, so, for example, at this particular election, um, roughly what's happened is that uh, Republicans went down starting in about 2005. They started falling. The number of people who considered that, and the number of Democrats went up. So the number Encouraging of, people to say that the Republican Party may go out of existence. There's going exactly. to be this trend, yeah. and we don't. It could be this. It could be the end of the Republican Party. Right, and and the Democrats were on a gain. Well, now what's happened is the Democrats have fallen, and uh, the number of independents is up, and Republicans have not gained. So that's very unusual because uh, to the this data that we're presently we're collecting uh, right now. Uh, back to 1937 on party identification, this period looks a little unusual in that normally when one party gains, the other party loses. Right. And now uh, both parties are losing and independents are gaining. So, so my view is this, this uh, that, that uh, if we wanted a variable that was a better predictor of what was going to happen to the president's party, if we knew more about party ID prior to the elections and how many people were moving to independent, Seems to me that's probably going to be a pretty good predictor of how well the president's party is going to do because they'll be moving, maybe not whether it's a Republican, they'll become independent or Democrat to independent. Those are bad signs for the president's party. And our hope is when we complete this data set that that will prove to be a pretty good predictor, oh, yeah, which we'll along with the state of the economy, uh, I think will be very, very helpful to uh, getting a model that uh, make, makes more sense. Well, let's talk about the state of the economy for a minute because I don't want to yeah. forget. Um, the economy's not very good. It's, we're in July right now. We're going to get the July job report uh, in a week and a half. Uh, we'll get the uh, we'll get July, we'll get August, we'll se September, three or four left before the election. Most people say, presume there's not going to be a lot of improvement. It could get worse even, but there's not going to be dramatic improvement for November. Right. So over the next three months, members of Congress and the president, to the extent he's out on the hustings, uh, a word I like to use, I have no idea what it means, but it sounds good. It, it means, I guess, speaking publicly on political issues. But uh, right. the hustings, I... Well, it, I think it came from the fact and they used to do it in card fields at the end of... Uh, the so harvest that's and husk. the state stand on. That's husk. Yeah. This is hustings, isn't it? Got no. me. Okay. Um, so the president will be out there to some extent talking about issues, and the, the issues are going to be horrible on the economy. Um, they could talk about health care reform that they passed, they could t which is not so uh, popular. They could talk about financial reform, which none of which will have been much in place. So they can only talk about the prospective benefits of it. The actual economy is going to be presumably – as mediocre as it is now, roughly, or perhaps worse, maybe a little bit better, but not good. So the president's already, I think yesterday, was out campaigning for folks saying, well, it's better than it would have been. Uh, that seems to me to be a remarkably tough sell. Uh, what will be the um, Democrats' argument, do you think, and the president's on the economy, uh, that, that it would have been worse? The, the other tack they try is, uh, they've been trying is, you know, we got this mess from Republicans, so we don't want to give them back the keys to the car. And yeah. <clears throat> how do you think that's going to? Well, go? I think they're going to be. I, I think you made a good point. They're searching around. Uh, they, if the election is national, if it's a national issue like the economy, 
then the Democrats will lose more seats. So their, their best chance is to uh, cast doubt uh, among the electorate as to what the Republicans would do. One way to do that is to uh, <clears throat> blame it on Bush and the Republicans, but it seems to me that's not cutting it. Uh, Democrats, when we, when we poll on that, Democrats believe that, but independents no longer. Uh, the independents believe it's Barack, o Barack Obama's uh, economy, and so do the, and the Republicans always did. Uh, actually, Obama had about a 42% approval rating to 38% disapproval among Republicans lasted about three weeks in January. I mean, when he first came into yeah, office, he, he actually had Donald. favorable approval. Uh, yeah, which is, yeah. about, not by much, but about three, four percent. He got a few that, weeks. That's yeah, good. and that's yeah. split pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, so I, I think the Democrats have to, uh, the Democrats are going to have to make the argument that it could have been worse, would be worse if the Republicans, we had about, they, they got to make the Republican Party the issue because they do, we do know that the Republican Party is not seen in a favorable light. It's, uh, it has about the same approval ratings as the Democratic Party, about 26, 27 percent. Uh, and so the result of that, uh, that is, they, they would like to make the Republican Party the issue, and they're going to talk about you can't say no to everything. So they will be casting about, in my view, for uh, what, 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 they, what might work. Yeah. What about the Senate? Anything to say about the Senate? Uh, the Senate... Uh, Fewer seats up for grabs. There are fewer seats up for grabs, but uh, there are uh, four sure seats that uh, will go to, uh, in my view, uh, North Dakota, uh, North Dakota, Indiana, um, uh, Delaware, and uh, Arkansas. We're going to go. Are, are currently go, Democrat. We'll go for a Democrat, but there's a couple seats that the Republicans might lose. Uh, there are eight seats that are sort of toss-ups. Uh, they could lose. Uh, Democrats could win in Missouri, for example. So I would say, uh, if, I had a, if I had to make a bet, I would say they'll pick up uh, six to eight seats. Not enough to get the majority. Everything would have to break perfectly for them to get the majority. Could happen. Right. And events could worsen in the yes. world and, and make yeah. that I, I did want to say the uh, one thing that... Um, about the House elections that is uh, sort of interesting... If you look at the generic poll, uh, we have data back to 1946. So within uh, three months of the election, there are only uh, two times other than right now when the Republicans led there, because of certain polling problems uh, on the generic ballot, uh, Democrats who have Democrats do better on on that poll. Uh, the only two times the the only two times the Republicans ever led was uh, before the 1946 election and before the 1994 election. And those are the two uh, major they, victories they yeah. had uh, before the... So even, even when they controlled the House in 96, 98, 2000, and 2002, and 2004, every one of those, the generic poll, generic ballot on Congress, showed the Republicans behind, with the exception of 94 and 46. So the fact that the Republicans, when you average across the polls, are up about one and a half, two points in the generic poll uh, is probably a pretty good sign for them. In those polls, are they typically looking at a cross-section of the American people, a cross-section of registered voters, or a cross-section of likely voters? Yeah. Because <laughs> those would three. be the three. Yeah, all three. Uh, so the the best site on this, I think, is uh, for, for your listeners, pollster.com. Uh, because what pollster.com did was they put together a bunch of people who know political polling. They um, they took 20 to 25 polls that they believed to be based on scientific uh, thing and so uh, but based on relatively scientific principles, and then they give you a moving average across them. And on the interactive one, you can click off and see any one poll and go into it, and, and they are uh, then taken exactly that way. Likely voters some are that way, so you can some choose, are the other yeah. way, and you average across them. Because occasionally you'll hear that the generic poll is way ahead for the Republicans, and I always think, well, with the data I see, they're always pretty close to even. Right. And I think that's because the people who want to tout those results are only looking at likely voters, right. and presumably Republicans are much more motivated than Democrats Exactly. Right now. The, the, the data we have from YouGov, uh, Polymetrics, that we just uh, completed a couple more polls, and the data clearly show independents and Republicans much more motivated to vote this year than, than uh, Democrats. Before we move on, I want to ask you a question about the Senate. 
uh, so if the if the Republicans pick up a few seats, which is likely uh, in your view, uh, the filibuster-proof majority, which was already teetering for the Democrats, will yeah. have disappeared. Um, this seems to be a new phenomenon. When, in my memory, I'm not a political junkie. In my memory, usually having a majority in the Senate meant you could get things passed in the Senate. Uh, the fact that now the, it seems everyone presumes, and it seems to be new, that you have to have at least 60 votes uh, in the Senate so that you can't face a filibuster. Is filibustering on the rise? Is there something going on here that's new? No, I don't. Am I uh, missing I, something? I, I do not think there's any evidence that it's on, on the rise. Um, in the post in the post World War, so if you actually look at polarized voting in the United States Congress, there's many different ways to measure it. Um, but I don't know if I can do this for your with listeners. your hands. Go ahead. I, so I'm, I'll be the economist. Assume okay. you have a truck. All right. No, so imagine. Yeah. <clears throat> so imagine. So imagine you took uh, on the left hand. You had uh, the most uh, on the at your fingers. You have the most uh, li- your most conservative Democrat, and your elbow is the most liberal. And then the reverse for the Republicans. The right fingers are. And then one way to do them is just let the two fall over each other. There could be no overlap. 10%. Hang on. 20, the visual image here, we yeah. got it. For those of you not following again on the video, uh, Telestrator. So, so Dave's <laughs> got his elbows on, uh, on the armchair. He's got one hand up in the air. These are the far left guys. He's got another hand up in the air. His elbows are sitting there. And when they fall toward the middle, uh, they could overlap or they could be far apart. Right. So far exactly. apart they are. Yeah. So imagine two distributions falling. They might overlap. They might not. So uh, they, might, they might be uh, bimodal with no overlap. They could be, uh, and it would be bimodal uh, with a little overlap, or they could overlap, so it would be something like a normal curve. Uh, it turns out... And with that, that, just again to finish the visuals, yeah. it, if it overlapped a lot and there was a normal curve, so there would be some liberal Republicans, exactly. some conservative Democrats. Perfect, thank you. So what, what that means is in the post, uh, really, after the 38 election, uh, until uh, the 60s, and not not finally accumulated until the 80s, the United States Senate and the House, to a certain extent, were dominated by, uh, or the votes were often dominated by the conservative coalition, which was Northern Republicans and Southern Democrats, it would unite on certain issues. So the Republican Party had their uh, Nelson Rockefellers and Bill Scranton's, and the Democrats had uh, William Russell and, and Scoop others, Jackson. Uh, Scoop Jackson, it's Scoop Jackson, etc. So, so uh, that pattern began to disappear in the '60s, and by the second term of Ronald Reagan, there was very little overlap as the parties uh, dominated. And so, the filibuster, in my view, it's not used less. The threat of it's, it's used more for partisan. It's used more in a partisan sense now. So imagine in the, uh, when was the filibuster used uh, for? Well, uh, in a, in a, in a, so you might be grazing rights. The government might want to increase grazing rights. So senators uh, from Idaho and Montana and uh, so on would uh, filibuster that. Uh, or on civil rights, there would be a filibuster, which sometimes northern Republicans would join with the Democrats. Sometimes they wouldn't. Uh, but now the filibusters are all Republican or all Democrat, and they're uh, dominated on economic issues like health care, cap and trade, which failed, uh, cap and trade, which failed yesterday because uh, there are a large number of Democrats from uh, Boca- from uh, coal states yeah. that are not going to vote for that. But in the current world, uh, you might say there are. Two slightly centrist, liberalish Republican senators from Maine. Well, and, very few. And Arlen Specter, who now is no longer a Republican from right. Pennsylvania. There aren't many left. So right. in, I guess another way to say what you're saying is you got to get all the Republicans yep. if you're going to avoid uh, the threat of the filibuster, right. at least. So, do you want to say anything before we move on on why that partisanship has gotten so ideological? Is it? What's going on there? We may have talked about this before, but I don't remember. Well, I think, uh, well, first, first of all, uh, it, what stands out in American political history, I've, I, I, we have run this data that I just talked to you back to 1840. 
And uh, the period that truly stands out is not the period where, they, where there's no overlap. The, what stands out is the post-World War II period, or depending on how you date it, the beginning in 38. The period where there's any overlap is the period that stands out. So normally American politics has been uh, polarized, but the present politics is seen, I think, in light of some what people believe are halcyon days, yeah. which I, I don't, don't, don't believe. Why do we... Go ahead. Sorry. So, so I think, uh, but what what drives it now uh, is that there there are relatively serious issues. So if you, you know, so in spite of President Obama's claim to bring about bipartisanship or the end of the bipartisan era, take take uh, what to do about global warming or take what to do about energy, uh, and so. If, if, if you believe, as I do, that the real solution to what, what to do about energy is, uh, when, is that uh, entrepreneurs, when they see an opportunity to make money, will put money in there and they'll invest in new energy sources. And, uh, and my view is that's the best way for that. To but if your view is that's not going to happen and entrepreneurs won't do that, then your view is the government should step in and regulate these things. Now, I don't see... Where's the compromise? Yeah, there? that's right. That's what, always what, been by, what, yeah, what do I do? <laughs> do half on this, and so we flip yeah. a nickel. So the point is, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not telling you I'm for certain right, but given my views, I'm not going to suddenly come around. And go, all right, let's regulate half the ener- uh, the economy, or let's only, or let's try twenty billion for for government right, exactly. running instead of forty. I mean, just not, yeah. that that would be a compromise yeah. that is not going to appeal at all to you. Exactly. Right? So on health care. Uh, same same sorts of things. That's the extent to which the government's going to control and regulate that. And if you believe that the way that healthcare decisions ought to be made is probably uh, more efficient, if it's a market and individuals get to choose, or uh, the alternative is no, that's not going to happen. So we have to do this. Well, I don't I don't know what the compromise is. All right, so I think. I think we're facing some pretty serious issues. Like, uh, can we afford to uh, all the unfunded liabilities we have? No, we can't. That means something has to be cut, and those are not issues that uh, are easily uh, resolved. I think by by a compromise. Yeah, I want to come back to that. Yeah. We'll come back a little bit and talk about healthcare in particular, but and entitlements. But before we do, I want to ask you about uh, the president. So the president uh, has, has faced steadily falling approval ratings, uh, pretty steady from his very, very bright opening, which is inevitable. There's been a, there's always a drop off, but it seems to, there's no, not much of a turnaround. Uh, it's been pretty steady, fall, steadily falling. Uh, the, there's going to be some loss in the house. We don't know how, probably, um, we don't know how big it'll be, but it could be large. Um, say what you might expect to happen in the 2010 to 2012 period, um, my speculation is that if the economy continues downward, which could easily happen that it's not continue, but if it reverses its modest improvement so far, uh, there will be strong pressure on Obama to change his, his policy position. He does not come across as much of a compromiser, partly because, I say that only because his Willingness to push through health care reform, which was not popular, he pushed it through anyway. Um, what do you think his prospects are in 2012? Well, I, I wonder if he'll get the, the nomination if he doesn't move to the center and if the economy has a double dip. I, uh, I don't think that, uh, I, I think the odds of uh, uh, there being a serious Democratic challenger to the first black uh, president uh, is not likely. Uh, would have to be really pretty bad. Yeah, uh, true enough. Uh, second, uh, I think that after they got health care through, um, I, uh, I, uh, I, I no, I thought they were done. Well, the agenda on uh, air and water and uh, global warming, cap and trade was gone. They, they have no majorities uh, for anything. Uh, the financial r- reform was one uh, where the Repu- Republicans, uh, somebody asked me the other day, why would the Republicans go along with this? Well, the reason is, if you look at polls, uh, about 75% of Americans uh, blame banks uh, for the whole thing in the first place, don't think all the money should have been given to the banks. 
and the pressure on the Republican Party to respond to that, to respond to that by saying, no, we don't want to regulate the banks, they're great, was uh, pr pretty high. So you knew they were going to get a finance bill, uh, uh, whether good or bad, uh, politics is politics, they responded to it. But other, other than that, I, I, I think the fact that the Democrats will lose seats, um, two scenarios. First scenario is uh, they lose uh, 35 seats, 30 seats, not enough to lose control. Uh, they lose six seats in the Senate. Uh, that essentially means that uh, whatever uh, agenda President Obama had uh, that was uh, more liberal is not, no, has no chance dead, of passing. Dead in the war. Uh, I think that actually, strangely enough, is the worst case scenario for his reelection. Why? Uh, because then the Democratic Party is fully responsible for the economy, it's fully responsible for everything. Uh, and then the alternative is the Democrats, uh, the Republicans actually, sorry, win the House of Representatives and the Senate, or one of those two. Then they're held partially responsible. So, uh, and Obama's something to run against in 2012. Right. Yeah, so in 1994, uh, when Bill Clinton lost the House of Representatives, that was the first time the Democrats had lost control of the House of Representatives in 40 years. The headlines were the tsunami, and Brookings had one on da da da, da and it was all, everybody said Bill Clinton was dead. How could he be reelected? There were right. so many Republicans <laughs> ready to run, right? And the Repo uh, so many Republicans. And, and Clinton looked demoralized. I mean, he, he was, was demoralized. He, you know, he said, yeah. "I'm still relevant." He looked, he looked like a man who'd yeah. lost a family member. He looked terrible. Exactly. And and what happened was the Republicans overplayed their hand. Yeah. And Bill Clinton didn't grow a spine. Uh, all he did was uh, veto uh, what him. he could veto, and it, and it worked. And he, and he right, passed. Yeah. And, he, and, he, and he bragged and took credit yeah. for things that yep. he thought were popular. And he, yeah, he took credit reform. for welfare reform, et cetera. And, and the bottom line was the economy got better. And as you know, he was over, uh, acted overwhelmingly. Yep. So, and then again, in 1946, when uh, <clears throat> the Republicans took over the House for the first time since 1930, uh, it was looked like Harry Truman was dead. In fact, it was so bad that uh, Fulbright, Senator Fulbright, proposed that Truman resign, uh, resign because the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who was then in order to be the president, would be, and there was no vice president because Roosevelt had died, suggested that Truman resign the presidency, and that would just give, don't make the Republicans the presidency now going in into the election. So they the ink. Yeah. That's how know. bad shape the <laughs> Truman was looked at. And he won. He did manage to win. Yeah, and he somehow. won in 48. So uh, the idea of the president being able to play against the other party. And remember Harry Truman campaigned on the do-nothing 80th Congress. Yeah. Well, you don't remember. Of course, I know, but, but I, I, know, I, know, I know of it. <clears throat> so, excuse me. The, so the point is that uh, that scenario, if the Republicans are in control and overreact, uh, allows the president to look better. <clears throat> Sorry. Well, yeah, I, I found it strange in '94, uh, not strange, but interesting, how poorly uh, the Republicans dealt with the thrill <coughs> of being back into the control of the House, and uh, uh, it, it just seemed they weren't ready for prime time. And they were not. They were so euphoric. <clears throat> they had the contract for America. They were sure that everything had changed. And again, uh, they made. They, uh, I think the United States uh, polling opinion data, you know, but there's disagreement among people in my profession, but I believe the United States is uh, essentially most people are center-right <coughs> on the economic dimension, sort of center-right on the social dimension, but not not nasty on issues of gay marriage. That's changing. Yeah, it's all, like that's it all changing. On the long haul. Closer to center-left <coughs> right. on many of those issues. Right, on the issues. So they're, they're on, on issues of social... On issue of social conservative, the country's more centrist and uh, even a little center left, as you suggest. And so the combination is when the Republicans came in in '94, <coughs> they overreacted, and the, and the country readjusts. Clinton now looks like a centrist. Right. Looks like centrist. he's a left board. Now right. he looks like a centrist. So he gets reelected. Truman in '46, when the Republicans uh, took in over the '46th Congress, there were many who wanted to repeal the New Deal. And uh, that was what got played up, and Truman reacted against that, and the result was that uh, he, he retained power. So I think both cases where the Congress shared power. Now, you know, as, as an economist or social scientist, you know can't make much at two in, 
uh, on two end, but th those are the only two we have. So yeah. we, you do the best you can with what you got. Yeah. Uh, but you could see the sort of general rule yeah. would be if you're held responsible, if, if you're not totally responsible for the government, then you can play off the other guy. The game changes. Of course, things could go swimmingly. <clears throat> this could, we could be at really at the bottom of the recession. Right. Things could go swimmingly. Uh, even if the Republicans uh, win a lot of seats, Democrats retain control. They're responsible, but maybe they'll look like geniuses and everything. Yeah, exactly. So that that could That's all another happen. Scenario. I mean, I doubt that the economy will be back that uh, much by then. But but the fact is, it won't be for the 2010 elections. Correct. But it surely could be. As it was for Reagan. Reagan, Reagan lost yeah. uh, 26 seats, uh, didn't have a majority, lost 26 seats in 1982, which if Obama loses 35, 37 seats, the prediction is about the same percentage. And if he loses that many seats, but the economy did turn around uh, beginning in um, or, or March, April, May of 83. And as it turned around, his ratings came up. And as we know, by 84, trounced. he trounced yeah. uh, Mondale. Well, so well, that's quite possible. Yeah, it's always amusing to me when they run a, a, any list of Republicans uh, against the incumbent. And they always do pretty well. Yep. I think virtually every Republican yep. that they could think of in a recent poll tied or beat Obama. Of course, they don't have to defend anything. <laughs> they right. have, they're not in a exactly. campaign. Yeah. It's a meaningless uh, it bit is. of entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about health care. Um, when we spoke about a year ago, <clears throat> the basic findings in your polls were that most Repub most excuse me most Americans like their health care, right. uh, didn't want it touched, were worried about some other people's health care, people who maybe they felt weren't getting good health care or had good health care insurance, <clears throat> but they weren't really pay very much for it. Right. And those results, I think, were sustained all the way through the last um, set of conversations about this and, and the political uh, arguments about it. And yet the House and Senate voted for it. Uh, clearly a program that did not get majority support, does not get majority support even now. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on why Congress seemed to leave the standard models of self-interest and uh, what, what, what happened there? Well, I think they actually followed the self-interest model. A few. And uh, <laughs> here's why. Uh, they followed it because they were, the Democrats were faced with the following choice. Uh, no bill, in which case they would be seen as absolutely incapable of governing. They all remembered 1993 when they failed to even get the bill out of committee. They remembered how badly they got beaten. Uh, and <clears throat> the costs of the bill are, uh, don't even really start until 2016. I mean, there are some short-term costs that will occur to old people on Medicare Advantage, etc. But none of those are going to really, uh, the major effects are not going to be uh, certainly until after the 2010 election, and by and large not until really after the 2012 election where you get the major costs. So the Democrats made a bid, uh, a bid, and their bid was, look, the real costs of this bill aren't coming down. If we pass this bill, we'll get a short-term burst in public, uh, we'll get a short-term burst in the press coverage that'll say we have achieved something here. And uh, then we can go back and defend having done this versus uh, having failed once again to produce a majority on, on this issue that, that we put as our number one priority. And uh, <clears throat> Obama sold it uh, to end. And my view is, uh, and I now quote John Kogan, uh, they got down to the Kogan rule of 10. Which is? And the Kogan rule is you get down to 10 votes, you can buy them. Yeah. They did buy, buy them in the sense, yeah. So the, the the guys from the Central Valley here in California, they got more water, and when you get down to ten, the final ten votes in the House, you can make deals. You got enough to, goodies to, to hand out exactly. to make them feel good about so, it. So uh, they got close, uh, and they and the argument they made was, we're going to sell it as uh, deficit neutral, uh, which it wasn't, of course, but they were selling it as it's a deficit reduction. And uh, the result was they got close enough and, and got the final set of votes. And, and I don't think that was a bad strategy. I think the Democrats per, uh, thought pretty hard about we don't want 94 again. Now, what has happened, the public... So we, we did uh, the weekend of the Brown victory in Massachusetts. We, we sampled, uh, my colleagues uh, Dan Kessler and Doug Rivers, we sampled 11 states, 500 voters in these 11 states that had competitive Senate races. That's a whole series question. Health care is one of them. And we just went back in again 
in the uh, two weeks ago in, in July, and then we're going to go back in again in October on the health care issue. And the American people, the one, the one thing, so Obama, the results show Obama did get a little bit of a pickup, about three, four points, thought health care was better after they got it passed, uh, but still not a majority for, although he did get a three, four percent pickup. So there's some growth <coughs> in support for the, yes. for the legislation However, goals. Yeah, the two questions that we focused on were, uh, will your health care, uh, with the passage of this bill, with the bills passed and signed, wording changes because four that hadn't passed, and then one right. was passed. But the question was, will do you what? What do you believe will happen to your coverage? Uh, will, well, I mean, what happened to your health care? Will it get better or worse? Seventy percent are my what? My health care will get worse. My, 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 my I'll get it'll get worse, and B it'll cost more. Okay, that stayed absolutely constant across voters before before and after the bill passed. Right. People believe that their health care will not be as good as it was and that the cost will go up. And that, uh, that's still, so, so when you ask, uh, when you ask, uh, would you vote for, when you ask people their vote intentions, they're more likely to vote against a Democrat that support it than uh, for a Democrat who opposed it. Well, there weren't. So that suggests that the Republicans <clears throat> in those 11 states are going to be hammering well, are going to gain, that. yes, they'll, they'll, they'll do well. Um, and when you say the, the Democrats made the calculation in terms of supporting the bill, yeah. of course there's no cabal. Um, they're leaders. You know, there's Harry Reid, there's Pelosi. Pelosi, of course, comes from a very liberal district. Yeah. Her own right. fate as a member of Congress is pretty safe. Her leadership yeah. in the House is always at risk. Reid, of course, is in serious trouble. Yep. May make it, may not. What were they thinking? Uh, you know, well, they don't, there's no collective. <clears throat> Pelosi had already passed the, Pelosi, the House had already passed the health care bill. No, it was more liberal than the. Right. They 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 they, bar they, uh, they just barely lost on the public option. Right. So they had a liberal majority for for the bill. The Senate was the question, right? Could they get it through in the Senate? And <clears throat> in the Senate, uh, Reed, uh, Reed Reed was uh, Reed Reed became convinced that uh, if he failed. And didn't get a bill, no health care bill. Then the campaign against him is, you know, he's, he's run as I'm the majority leader. I'm from Nevada. I've been able to bring stuff home. And the claim is, you know, what kind of... That, so then the campaign against that. So politicians are always thinking about how are they going to run against me. Yeah, right. And I think the run against him, that kind of would have been, he's a guy who can't get anything done. Right. Let's, let's get somebody in there who can get something done. Now, I, I think he, his chances having passed it are better. Uh, but this <clears throat> not, might not be very good, right? <laughs> yeah. But but the but the thing is, Nevada's uh, the one state uh, two of two states. Well, Nevada's one of two states where fifty percent uh, actually approve of the health care bill, and uh, given the high unemployment rate, uh, it's correlated. Approval is uh, actually pretty heavily correlated with uh, what your job status is. So I, I don't think he hurt himself with that. Mm -hmm. I think that's his calculation. Do you think? There will be folks campaigning uh, in the House and the Senate on repealing, or is that just going to be talk? <clears throat> well, uh, I hear heard, a lot of talk about it. Is yeah, it I hear a lot of talk about it. My view is it's uh, pretty dumb because it ain't going to happen. Uh, the president, the, the, no matter how many seats the Republicans win, they're not going to be able to override a presidential veto. The president is not going to. That would be, in my view, overreacting on the Republican part. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. In 2006, when, uh, when the Democrats won control of the House, first time in uh, 12 years, there was a lot of pressure on Nancy Pelosi to uh, impeach the president, turn, turn back the Bush tax cuts. Right. <clears throat> and I thought she handled her membership reasonably well on that. We're not going to do that. We're interested in winning in 2008. If we if we proceed to try and impeach the president, that's not going to help us in 2008. That I, so she balanced that, uh, that that sort of thing off pretty well. And so the question is, uh, will the Republicans uh, will the Republicans be able to do the same thing? They didn't in 1994. Now they they may not uh, campaign on a promise of repeal, but they're certainly going to campaign on on the fixing it, yeah, and the ne or the negative aspects of it. One of the things that's strange about the health care uh, legislation is that uh, the status quo was not sustainable. Uh, contrary to popular belief, I always found it strange in the run-up to that 
uh, those votes that opponents of Obamacare would put up a chart of how horrible healthcare organization would look. You know, they'd have flow charts of how complex it would be, yeah. as if the current world were some yeah. nirvana yeah. of simplicity. Of course, the current world government's heavily involved. And a, you know, a parody of this view is the so-called, I don't know if these are real or apocryphal, but the interviews with the Tea Party members who say, you know, they're members of the Tea Party because they don't want Obama, they don't want the government touching their health care as if yeah. they're in some free market paradise. Right. Of course, the government pays for most of people's health care. Um, so it's hard to imagine uh, what the long-term healthcare world is going to look like. Uh, yes, there's a lot of animosity to the Obama care. It doesn't have a majority of support even now. Uh, as you say, maybe in some states it has some improved view, but it's still, a, I think at a national level, most Americans are against it. But you have to ask them, what are they for? What could possibly be proposed that would be uh, passable, uh, that would preserve people's right to choose their own doctor and spend other people's money. Uh, it's not a sustainable position. So what do you think that issue is going to, what's going to happen over the next 10, 20 years in that, with well, that I, issue? I think that uh, the, that's an insightful uh, question. The, I, I always thought the debate over health care from all sides was not good. And so the Republicans would talk about, you know, the Democrats, uh, this, uh, they want to restrict the amount of health care, they want to ration it. Yeah. Well, of course, it has to be rationed in some way. The question is, is it going to be rationed by a market where individuals get choices, or is it going to be rationed by the government as it is in Great Britain? Now, I, I happen to come down on the side of believing it's better if we have freedom and we can choose uh, in a market what, what sort of health. That's the way to ration it. Like, most, me, yeah. like most political scientists, <clears throat> yeah. right, Dave? I'm sure no, you're... <laughs> no, unlike most political yeah. scientists. But... But my but but the but the problem is that uh, the Republicans, e even though in my view they were right to oppose the bill, uh, have proposed no solutions. The only thing that's going to save the whole thing, in my view, is that <clears throat> sort of since 1932, 33 with Roosevelt, the uh, issue of health care and the issue of uh, the government uh, trying to take risk out of our lives, et cetera, et cetera. Is my, and and in some, some, up to a certain point, that's not a bad thing. Uh, but the fact is that we've now overpromised. Uh, forget, forget unfunded liabilities, uh, retirement. We have made too many promises to too many people about what can happen, and we can't afford it. We, have, we don't have the money. And healthcare is sort of the classic example of it. So in the past, starting with Roosevelt and then uh, moving to uh, Kerr McGee and then to Medicare Medicaid and after Medicare Medicaid, SCHIP, which is the state uh, children's health insurance program, to <clears throat> Bush's uh, Medicare Prescription Drug Act. In each case, the emphasis has been on entitlements and rights and increasing coverage. And now about everybody's covered by this bill, and now it's time to pay the bills. And uh, the Congress cannot pay the bills uh, with the system it is. They can't tax to the extent that they wish. So my view is the solution in health is going to look uh, considerably different, and uh, they're going to have to figure out uh, who pays for it and how they pay for it. And uh, I think the health care system will uh, ultimately, if it's going to work, take away... Uh, the deduction for employer, the tax deduction for employers who give it, they're going to have to be innovative uh, solutions that let markets go to work, that let uh, healthcare markets work, that let insurance programs uh, vary, uh, vary, the, uh, vary the kinds of coverage that they have. Uh, it's either going to look like that or it's going to look like uh, Great Britain. Great Britain or something. But even, you know, none of the European countries, in spite of the fact that they, they haven't solved the health care problem either. They right. have, they're, they're all, the British uh, system was broke, it's been fixed again, the French system is now broke. Not, I'm not knocking any of them in particular. Uh, in fact, the Dutch system is uh, one that I admire in some ways because they got a lot of markets in there with, with a special government program, sub, special uh, funding for people who are chronically ill uh, that actually, uh, when the government takes care of that, uh, keeps costs down because it uh, makes insurance markets more effective. Uh, there's, there's, none of them have solved the problem. Let me talk about the political problem uh, that an individual uh, member of 
of Congress or the Senate or a party might face and how it might play out on these kind of issues. Um, as you say, we've made a lot of promises we can't keep. Uh, we've seen that playing out in foreign countries recently, in, in Greece somewhat, the threat of it in Spain and elsewhere. And in those situations, uh, reality is a reality check and there's a very dramatic response, or at least what appears to be a dramatic response. Um, it's hard to imagine those responses in the United States for the following reason. One is our system moves very slowly. Uh, it's hard to have radical change in the United States for whatever reason. It seems to be built into the system. Um, how are individual politicians going to deal with the fact that they're probably going to have to take away stuff from people? They're really not good at that. So even today, no. even in July of 2010, when a huge part of the electorate is worried about deficits, rightfully or wrongful, wrongly, I mean, I, that's another issue, Just, but it's a worry. It, it has a lot of salience in the electorate. Uh, there is no uh, political mandate to cut spending. No, no politician has come out and said, we're living beyond our means, and therefore we have to cut spending. There's ones who say we have to add a value-added tax. Yeah. There's ones who want to invoke the Laffer curve and say, oh, no, we can, <clears throat> we can keep cutting taxes. That's how we'll, we'll deal with these deficits. Where is the resolve or how might it ever happen in the United States that we would cope with some of these changes, uh, these realities, by taking stuff away from people? And how would the political process begin to deal with that? Well, the... <clears throat> I think uh, I guess I think that's the fundamental question. There are t two parts to it. One, uh, it the Europeans uh, face the problem that that we're, we're going to face. Uh, we, we do face, but not quite as seriously as they do, because they have uh, lower lower population growth, higher welfare payments, etc. They have made some changes. I, I don't know whether. Those parliamentary systems uh, are better than we are at making the decision. I would say I was somewhat surprised by the first round by the German and other decisions, uh, w which were uh, pretty impressive on, on cutting back benefits. Uh, so the question then is, uh, how is it going to happen in the United States? So the, so the, the second question is, is the United States specially unqualified to do this? And there's a plausible case for that. I, I do worry that None of the European, none of the democ, and not just Europe, Japan. They have not done any democracy where representatives are elected short term <clears throat> has not faced up to this question very well. And we don't know of very many instances where they take something away from people that they've given. In fact, I don't, uh, and, 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 and that it's sustainable. Right, I mean, you do have, say, in California, that cuts uh, state employees ten percent or so. Uh, but but the assumption in the United States always was we grow our way out of it. Yeah, and pretty much you did. Yeah. But this, maybe it's growable out of it. Maybe there's somebody out there who has some, the next uh, internet, the next innovation that's going to give us energy at uh, three cents a gallon, and so yeah. we'll all be more productive, or three cents, whatever it costs. Yeah. Uh, uh, but. In lieu of that, which which we can't predict, um, in lieu of that, I think we do face the problem that politicians, there are very few politicians who, who talk about, first of all, who talk very straightforwardly about what the nature of the problem is, who give straightforward numbers and say you're going to have to give some things up. There is some hope individually. Chris Christie in uh, yeah. New Jersey seems to be actually for. appears to be doing it. Uh, some candidates are talking like that. Christie actually appears to be doing it. Uh, Andrew Cuomo in New York appears to be but, campaigning on it. Right. Whether but it we're going to have, so we're actually going to have uh, an experiment in the United States. My view is uh, it'll be in the states where it's first taken care of. Won't be the federal government. It'll be the states that start to work on it. And governors will innovate. And uh, that, that's our best hope is that that's what works. And if they get that, and, and, and if uh, conservatives are right, if you can get that spending under control, et cetera, the economies really ought to grow and uh, service, uh, adequate level of services be provided. But in the short term, um, um, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, happy about that. I'm not, I'm not uh, sanguine about the prospects in the short term of actually making real decisions about these problems. I mean, there's a deficit. Reduction Commission uh, that's going to give a report, I think, at the end of this year. And uh, the Erskine Bowles, who's the chair of it, 
uh, who's a Democrat, uh, has has supposedly uh, delivered the harsh message that we're going to have to have some auster austerity where the federal government would only be 21% of, of GDP, which I think would be an all-time high. It's other well, than right now, where it's 25, but historically it's in the 18 yeah, to 20 18 percent to 20 range. Percent, yeah. Peacetime. Yeah. Uh, so 21 would not really be austere by, yeah. by historical right. standards. Um, and then you have the Republicans who call themselves the party of small government, but uh, that's um, but have not been never have they're voting. Uh, yeah. Nope. Yeah. So they they talk. The rhetoric is different, but they seem to do the same thing as Democrats, which is spend money on their friends rather than the Democrats' friends. Which is well, I think they're a little more reluctant. They're not. The Democrats seem happier about spending. That's the true. Republicans spend it. Feel a little guilty about it. But yeah, I think that's <laughs> correct. <yeah. laughs> but in practice, it doesn't seem to be much different. So I think you're right, though. I think the the governor activity right now is is of of interest. Um, you want to speculate? We're almost out of time. Do you want to speculate at all on who the Republicans might nominate? Uh, it's kind of a parlor game, a silly one, but often fun. Who do you think uh, might challenge? You, you've said Obama's going to get the nomination, uh, almost certainly, well, I, in 2012. Yeah, You're confident yeah, my, about that. If I had, but when you say certainly, if you mean by that you have a gun at my head and said, your children and your wife's life, if you get it wrong, that's what I guess. Uh, well, I don't think it'll be uh, Sarah Palin, and I don't think... Uh, I don't think it'll be Mitt Romney. I, I think that the uh, presidential candidate for the Republicans will come out of uh, the states and it'll come out of uh, state elections. Uh, so I'm, I'm waiting to see, just like <clears throat> uh, in 1998, uh, uh, that Governor Bush of Texas came out uh, and uh, and had run 69% of the vote, 59% of the women's vote, 49% of the Hispanic vote in Texas, and that pretty Looked well pretty drove good. him right to the front. Yeah. So I'm looking to see uh, what will happen in the state elections and to see what uh, some governors uh, might do. So We'll see. Yeah. My guest today has been David Brady. Dave, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, thanks for having me again. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.